start with the pledge of allegiance of the flag. Where's our flag? There it is. Yeah. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I don't believe there's anyone here for public comment, but I will read this statement regarding the conduct of the meeting. Due to the COVID-19, the September PFA board meeting will be a hybrid meeting for PFA resolution 2-8, virtual for staff and the public and the board members, chief and administrative staff present at 102 Remington Street. Instructions to join the meeting follow. Individuals who wish to make comments regarding items scheduled on the agenda or wish to address the PFA board during public comment on item not specifically scheduled on the agenda must use the Q&A option in the meeting or send comments to public comments at hooter-fire.org. Your comments, questions will be read by a monitor and answered by the board. Christian, have we had any? Communication? Not that I've seen. Patty, have you seen any public comment? No public comment. Yeah, Darren. Darren joined us. Okay. Welcome, Darren. First item, discussion item would be one, the Puder Fire Authority Board Agenda Planning Calendar. Um, have you got any comments on that? It's just uh, kind of got us lined out. It's, uh, so it, it is, today is by our by our policy that today is the first uh, first report of the proposed twenty one budget. So it's also it's just a reminder. In October, uh, staff works on the feedback from the board. Uh, we come back in November with a work session on the budget. Finish the budget up in December. One of the things that's not reflected on here right now, and I think that's probably going to be a timing factor uh, from our special meeting we had uh, a couple weeks ago, is the RFP for recruitment has gone out. Uh, recruitment for a uh, new fire chief, that's gone out, uh, that went out Friday. So it's still pretty fresh and it, it's a three week soaking of that in. I believe that's right. You know, that, that bobber float for about three weeks. Uh, and uh, so what we will staff will work on once we get that timeline kind of honed in, uh, and that's going to kind of depend on that recruiter, uh, that will reflect uh, any time the board needs to take action or meet uh, regarding that. And just a reminder, the board decided that they would be a committee of five, that the entire committee would work with the recruitment committee. And so uh, we'll be posting meetings and stuff, so we'll try to keep that caught up as we get a schedule more. Uh, for that, those those are the highlights on the uh, planning calendar. Will we uh, will the board get copies of the rules and regulations uh, prior to the meeting? Yes, on the rules and reg meeting, which is uh, that's a, for the October meeting. Yes, uh, and we'll, yeah. we'll we'll plan to send that to you as a red line so you can yeah, see where the changes good. are. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we'll give you plenty of time. Uh, We've been uh, on that one. We've been waiting for the ratification of the contract because there are some uh, some items that are both in the contract and in the rules and regs, and we want to make sure they were aligned. So we want to have ratification. That's on your consent calendar today. So then we'll bring back the rules and regs. Uh, so next those, month. those rules and regs will will include what changes that you yeah. agreed to in the union. Right. Are there any other comments on the calendar? I'm sorry. I'm sure we're on to the internet here, so I, I don't know what to confirm you. Okay. So, <laughs> I just want to get the, the agenda up. So, I'm used to having paper and I'm, I'm a little. I'm Do you need afraid. paper because then I have to get it. No, that's all right. I mean, it's hopefully it's an ability to uh, figure out.
the agenda and I, I'm lost without it. Thank you. You're welcome. We're ready to move on to consent. I think we need to get a approval for the agenda of the planning calendar. Planning agenda. We don't need a motion, do we? Or? No, no, we don't usually. No, we don't just for discussion. All right, let's move on. We got the consent agenda. We have the PFA board August 25th meetings, special board meetings. Approve and adopt a nationwide post employee health savings plan. Approval of restated intergovernmental agreement for joint professional firefighter certification. Five ratification of the 2021 collective bargaining agreement. Is there any discussion with that or is there a motion to accept that set that agenda? I would move to uh, approve the consent agenda. Second. Second. What motion? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aaron, are you there? Yes, Ken? Mike. Aye. Aye. Kim. Very good. Next item on the agenda, number six, COVID-19 response and financial impact updates. We'll open that up to you, Tom, and then I guess you'll put that to uh, Yeah, okay. so uh, as uh, we did yesterday with the district board, I'm going to turn this over to Chief Vanderbilt. Uh, hasn't been, there's been some changes. There's been some changes statewide uh, with the uh, with COVID. We owe the governor re up his uh, 30-day mask requirement. Uh, I'll just, because I sat on that governor's panel, one of the things that came back uh, the last time we met, which was two weeks ago, uh, well, it'll be two weeks ago this Thursday, was that there's research coming out out of uh, University of Colorado and actually from around the country that with masks, uh, they're seeing even when you're exposed that what we've been, you know, what we've been taught is that the mask prevent us from exposing others. That still holds true, but they're finding that the mask, if someone exposes you, the, there is a reduced viral load and COVID is a very much dose-specific illness. So it does reduce the viral load. And that was one of the things that the CDPHG reported back to us. And I think that uh, something that, that, uh, to share because we are maintaining our mask policies in our stations. Here we are in our meeting uh, doing the same thing. So uh, that's uh, one of those items that uh, brought back from the governor's panel. But I'm going to turn it over to Vandy to talk about what we're doing operationally out on the line. And then we'll turn it over to Ann and talk about finances. I have a few comments when we get to that. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Um, just first want to say everybody is doing just a great job of, of taking care of each other, the, um, their partners, and their families, and and uh, going all out and, and following our procedures. So. We did have just a few changes. We continue to monitor everything that's going on. And some of the changes we made were uh, they, people can wear some safety, wear their safety glasses on EMS calls. They don't have to wear goggles on every call now. So um, the shift change, we made, it, made changes during the summer. So that way the shift change happened out on the apparatus front pad um, with the inclement weather coming. We wanted to make sure we were able to do shift change uh, for the apparatus. We can do it in the bay. We're keeping our six foot distancing and and uh, just taking care of each other that way. <clears throat> our firefighters are working out in the in in the stations and again keeping six foot distancing. Just making sure that uh, we're cleaning the equipment and uh, taking care of each other that way. And uh, still with Station guests were um, not letting people come into the stations and monitoring anybody that's coming in to do maintenance and things like that. But we're still not allowing family and friends to to just stop by and visit. But other than that, people are doing a great job. Uh, no new cases with any of our firefighters and uh, nothing else to report unless you have any questions. Any board members have any questions? No. No. Thank you, Vandy. You bet. Thank on you. The, um, 
on the finance part of this report, uh, we're going to cover a good bit of this under the budget here in a couple of agenda items. But I did want to hit on a couple highlights. Um, the biggest highlight is not nearly as bad as we were afraid. Um, and so that's the really good news. So we did some freezes early on in the year, uh, some positions that were new for 2020 that we delayed, um, and some freezes on expenditures. Some of those weren't very hard because we had to um, cut back on training while there was no place to go. <laughs> no training and travel because you couldn't go anywhere. So um, that helped us save some, some, here. <laughs> that's some significant, I mean, painful, but you know, not hard to, not hard to enforce. Um, so um, now we're reaping the benefits of those savings to balance out the budget for 2020, which is going to be a little bit behind because of uh, revenue from the district coming in a little bit behind. Um, for 2021, we're, um, I, I guess the theme here again is not nearly as bad as it could have been. Um, and so um, as we go through the 2021 budget, you'll see um, a flat budget and flat is good. Flat is feeling very good for 2021 um, when we were considering that we could be down uh, in the millions of dollars at one point. Um, so we'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but that's the that's the bottom line for the COVID financial impact for 2020 and 2021. Um, and uh, we can talk more about that in the budget. And I, I will add I took the, some of the things that we we're looking at freeing up. Um, I thought you were talking about the budget. But things that the board appropriated for 2020, we're freeing some of those up. We've had, uh, we've gone ahead and we've hired uh, our, our port mechanic and we, we are moving ahead with uh, plans for station six, uh, which was appropriated. We saw we could get through 2020 uh, without having to earmark that money toward our operations as well as station seven. There's some other uh, things that we're looking at freeing up as well uh, that were uh, frozen in that budget, but uh, Station 7, we are we're moving forward, starting to begin some charrettes and and uh, getting the, the, the architectural design of what's going to be probably a pretty unique station because of the size of the, the, the lot. So uh, those things, were, we, we feel really good, uh, comfortable financially to open those things up that we have budgeted to, to continue those uh, through this year, and there's through the budget, we may mention some of the other ones that uh, are included in that, but those are really two big capital items also on our apparatus budget uh, that, uh, that opens up to where we can keep that, our, uh, our glider program going, at, uh, which is a refurbishment of sorts. So uh, we, we feel comfortable about that moving into 21 with the, the news we have on the 21 budget. Aaron has his hand raised, so we might have a comment. Yeah, thanks, Kirsten. Thanks, Mike. Um, and I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you, with you all. Appreciate it. The audio and video are really clear, though. <clears throat> and and Tom, I wonder if, you know, for those for those organizations that are property tax reliant, heavily property tax reliant, what I'm hearing is 2022 is is very concerning. Are you going to talk about that in the budget discussion? Uh, I, 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 if I was just at, I was just thinking the same thing, Darren. I think there's some discussion that'll probably also need to be about, and Anne's going to discuss the Proposition B, our Item B, on the November election with Gallagher. There, uh, there's a Gallagher impact, uh, Darren, as well as the decline in commercial property values, which is driving Gallagher to at least a 5.88. Residential assessment rate, is that what you're referring to, some of the Gallagher impact? Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, and so watching that uh, election closely, and on the district side, uh, they've already taken, it's a Tabor election that they did. So uh, just on the city side, we'll have to watch that closely. Yeah, Darren, one of, the, one of the things that that we're thinking about as we're doing the 2021 budget is, um, not doing things that box us in on 2022 because that is very unknown. Um, we don't know what will happen with in November with that uh, Gallagher item B. And so the things that we're doing are things that we can roll back. Uh, we're going to we continue to to put in um, one-time money into capital 
and uh, those are fully funded. We do still have really good reserves. And I think that's, uh, that's important to remember so that if 2022 comes along and B has failed um, and we haven't done anything else to address property taxes on the city side, um, then uh, we, have, we have some wiggle room. Um, we have some cushion uh, to, to cushion that landing. We thought we were saving that money because of KFCG and uh, KFCG turned out well and got renewed and that was started January with the new formula. Um, but it, it may be it may be the rainy day we were saving it for was was uh, Gallagher 2022. COVID-19. <sighs> that sounds great. Thank you. I, I just think that, you know, as we're talking about 21 budgets, I think it's good to include some just context for what we might experience in 2022. So thanks, Ann and Tom. Eric? Go ahead. Um, about the, you said we hired the fourth mechanic, is that right? Yes. And so um, knowing that some of that was, we were doing that because we had other um, fire departments and authorities that were wanting to use that service, is that, are we still finding that um, to be the case that we're getting that business? For, yes, we, we have, uh, we had uh, our legal staff craft an IGA with, uh, with Windsor Severance. Uh, in fact, anytime you drop in, they usually have one of their apparatus out there so uh, we started that and uh, working with we have uh, we've done some work for Wellington already just more formalizing that for Wellington and uh, we've also had interest expressed from Front Range Fire which is Johnstown as well as Laramie District 2 which is the northwest side of Cheyenne around uh, uh, Warren Air Force Base uh, have so uh, Brad is working, wanting, wanting to make sure that we don't overfill that to where our, you know, our, our apparatus is still number one. That's the, the front line, uh, the front line effort out there. So uh, it, it's underway, but we also have, you know, get those, that place remodeled. Uh, one of the things that we also talk about is the combination of the, the Bureau of Safety position. And we've had that discussion with this board since Oh, for many years, actually, about getting a position that can help with our facilities and the construction and stuff. And uh, in, in an interim, we haven't uh, filled the position permanently yet, but in the interim, Captain Mark Hedinger is working in that capacity. He has a construction background, and he's been in there about six weeks, and we can demonstrate he's already saved us $300,000 just for his construction knowledge. And so he's looking at things that station six that we, first we were just going to add two bays out to the west end. We're looking at other options that there could be in that same budget ways to use the, 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 the space we have now and build bays for uh, response out of there. They're closer to the day room, closer to the, the, the bunk rooms uh, to get us to improve our response times even a little bit more. So uh, he's, he's really taking that, uh, that bull by the horn. Doing a, a great job on that. So, uh, yeah, we've got the fourth mechanic and we're excited about where that's going to go. Hey, since we brought that up, <laughs> sorry, it's not a little tangent, but somewhere in the budget, I think it was an unfunded um, priorities or something. We had shown that we were going to build a building out at the training center and hire a mechanic and do stuff out there. I'm assuming. That's off the table now. Yeah, well, the, that's, yeah. Uh, we, we had that plan uh, nine years ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and that but was, that was under John. it was John's. still on a list of there for. You know. Yeah, we kept it on the list for a while, but we've stood that down. Uh, okay. And part of standing that down, uh, uh, staff will remember, was the fact that we could redo uh, sure. Station 6. We still have, there, there could be long range plans for storage space, but as we add new stations, you know, we get a bay here, a bay there, where we can store some of our apparatus, but uh, we want to make sure that we've got a good warm place to keep our, our, our reserve apparatus. And as we grow, the amount of reserve apparatus we have has to grow along with that. So when something broke down, we can get in. Aaron, this is, uh, this is Mike. I was going to ask you, is, uh, is the city still, uh, going to pursue the annexation of the uh, Mulberry Corridor in 2021? 
Um, Mike, we are, COVID put a six month hiatus on the Mulberry um, analysis just because the first part of it was so heavy outreach. Um, uh, We have a project team that's gonna be continuing their work, um, but but admittedly it's been significantly slowed down. Um, I, I can't imagine, Mike, there would be any Mulberry annexations in 2021. I think the planning work will be done, the financial, you know, um, estimates, the relationships with the various governmental entities, that work is all going to need to be done, which I think will occur in 2021. But I don't, I don't foresee any annexations occurring in that, in that, um, in that time frame. So I guess, Anne, when we look at our revenue stream, we could consider that funding is still available. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Dave, Darren. Yep. Any other questions regarding uh, still on the uh, COVAC 19, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. We, and I just wanted to, because those things have been frozen, they kind of yeah. cross pollinate a little bit with the budget, but there's things in 2020 that we we're able to free up and you know, go ahead and get those, uh, those funds expended. Really excited about Station 7. Uh, I'll come back and see that, that, that thing when it's done because it's. Uh, been there a long time and it was uh, back in those days it was strictly low bid yeah. and so uh, and it's going to be have to be pretty creative it'll probably be a two station or two story station to fit on the footprint uh, to get the, the crew all in there and stuff so and the other thing that I have asked is that we make sure it has a community room that we've done in all our other stations because that is that is a gathering point for the community of, of the board so are you going to bring back some designs that we get to take a look at? Or? Yeah, we, we go through that. What was our, what was our, our probably thing? start, Mike, though, is with charrettes with the firefighters that are out there, with the architects. But what do they need? What can we make them? Uh, what, what the efficiencies and stuff? Uh, they have uh, some of the crews out there have expressed uh, making sure that we have the base space for, we've got a boat out there now uh, that is our, for uh, our river rescue, but also uh, a boater on it, use it on horse tube. And we're thinking in the future of Glade, uh, they will have the south end of Glade uh, and you know, Livermore will have the top end and, and we'll have the, the south end. So uh, thinking of those things in the future and uh, working out uh, 50 years, we'll be in that for sure uh, before we probably even remodel it. So uh, a long kind of best. Very good, is there any other questions regarding COVID-19? Mike, I, before you go to the budget, can I just back up to the collective bargaining agreement? Absolutely. Uh, and just one, one minor point, we're showing that Kristen's going to sign that. And I guess it ought to be you. I'm sure we can change that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, we finished these contract negotiations in June, yeah. May, yeah. June. Right. So um, I think we can fix that before you. We have, uh, we have it I'm signed. I'm sure. Thank you, David. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I always count on you. Yeah, to right. Come up with those. Pay attention to the details. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, with that, let's move on to uh, discussion item number seven uh, discussion of the 2021 preliminary budget. Well, it's, it's this is not a very, uh, I'm going to turn this over to Ann and Kirsten here real quick, but this is not a real elaborate budget uh, because, as Ann said, we're flat to maybe a little bit pink. Uh, we're not red like we thought we would be, uh, so staying flat. Uh, we've, we've got uh, no raises coming to any of our employees for the year. We, we do have increases in some of that total compensation on the pension side, uh, death and disability side, insurance side. So I'll let Ann discuss that and leave that discussion. Ann, take it away. All right. So the first thing we want to talk about is the revised 2020 budget. Um, we aren't going to be asking for any action on this at this point, though we may come back to you before the end of the year if we need to do any reappropriation. Right now, we're going to do what we need to do within the context of the existing appropriations and moving money around. Um, but if we have to make any changes for 2020, we'll be, we'll be back. Um, so as I mentioned before, we, we have a, a slight decrease in, in uh, revenue from the district for 2020. Um, and uh, we're pretty confident that we're going to come up about $50,000 short in uh, specific ownership tax 
on this, uh, that's based on vehicle sales uh, in the county. And those just have been uh, behind all year uh, since uh, March. And so we don't believe we're gonna, that's gonna catch up. So we're confident that. The other piece of the revenue shortfall in, in 2020 from the district is in property tax collections. And as of August, we're about $200,000 short of, of that. Um, every day, uh, money still continues to come in at the county. Um, we are in the, uh, in the period where people are on notice that they are delinquent and that their properties will go to tax sale in November. If they don't pay, we expect that some of these people will be paying. Um, the state gave them a grace period where they didn't have to pay any, um, any uh, uh, fees or fines for, for late payment. And so I think a number of people have probably just taken advantage of that. So we're, we're, we're watching that day to day to, uh, to see how 2020 is actually gonna come in. Um, and we'll revise accordingly for 2020. Um, the city's contribution is the same. Um, so we were really relieved and happy to, to have that um, uh, continue in 2020 uh, without uh, having to make any adjustments. Um, the city did uh, see some of the property taxes that would have, no, would have come to us under the formula if, if it was updated every year. Um, and so they, they got some of those funds in 2020 because the uh, reassessment that happened in 2019 was significant, um, quite a bit of an increase. Um, and that balanced out a little bit of the impact of PFA because it was a, a two year budget cycle. So we're thankful for that um, uh, not changing in 2020. Um, there's a table in your, in your packet that, um, that summarizes the, how we're balancing 2020. Um, we talked about some delays um, in freezes that we instituted in, back in April when we had so much uncertainty. Um, we uh, saved some money on succession hiring. Um, David's asked us to change our word from overhire to succession hiring, and, I, and we like it. <laughs> Um, we didn't hire as many as we expected to in this current class of uh, recruits out of the academy. So we saved a little bit of money there. Um, of course, that's a cost in the long run because you end up paying overtime for people you didn't, were, positions you weren't able to fill. We froze the physical therapist position um, that probably will freeze for the rest of the year. Um, some savings in public affairs and um, public education and we have a vacancy there and a new position that has been hired. As Tom mentioned, the new mechanics started yesterday. So that gives us three mechanics and one supervisor out there. And uh, I think everybody's pretty excited about that. Um, some other savings in uh, part hours, the paramedic pay has not been implemented yet. And, and as, as we mentioned, the travel and training budget, um, we have some significant savings there. For a total of about $600,000, um, we did have some costs that we need to meet with that. Um, we have we had a um, hazmat equipment grant that we had put money into into the budget for in 2019, and that did not pan out for us. We had another opportunity, and so we want to take or try to take advantage of that, um, and uh, and uh, also pay for the disposal of some obsolete foam that uh, we, we want to dispose of environmentally in a, an environmentally responsible way. That's the PFAS foam, the PFA foam. Right. right. That have been, uh, we did have some in one of our foam trucks. Uh, of course, there are companies that will dispose of them. Yeah, for price. They're really good for <laughs> Probably pay more to dispose than money pay to buy it. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> we also had a, uh, uh, the district got to go out and visit the burn building, the new burn building yesterday. Um, it was a really cool tour and uh, exciting to see. Um, it did go a little bit over budget, some from, from uh, the help of the county uh, putting us through the ringer on, on their process and uh, had some cost overruns there. But uh, it's done and, and it's pretty exciting. So uh, we want to cover that over overage. Um, we had some very significant legal expenses in 2020, um, and those are still ongoing. We haven't finished the year, 
um, and we were expecting that that could be as much as $150,000 over our budget. Um, our budget is 112, 100, a little over $100,000. And uh, so with an additional cost of $150,000, that's a pretty significant uh, impact, but an unavoidable cost. Um, much of that is based on issues in labor relations and contract negotiation and uh, employment related uh, issues. Um, we think it's money well spent, but it's uh, it's a significant cost increase. And then finally, we can cover that. Are those, are those, uh, those internal uh, legal? Uh, well, those, that's outside legal counsel, primarily with Ireland Stapleton down in Denver. On our contract negotiations with the union? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So they, um, you know, Ireland Stapleton has specialties in a lot of areas. They have folks that work on in employment law, um, litigation, and then our general counsel who, who does fire district work all the time. So it's really a combination of all of those, all of those disciplines and, and uh, legal expenses. Do you, uh, do you have any projections that that's going to continue, Tom, uh, with the legal end of it on the, on the contract negotiations? Okay. Well, we come right back into negotiations uh, next spring, yeah. uh, March and April. And so, uh, not, not speaking for the next generation of leadership, but my anticipation would be that Iowa uh, Stables will be engaged in those as well. We, we probably ought to make sure that we have enough money budgeted rather than going into an overrun. Yeah. yeah, we are planning on increasing our our, uh, our budget for that for next year because we are doing two contracts in a row. Um, you know, we had been do we were planning to do a contract every other year, um, and we just did a one year contract for 2021. Do another one in 2022, so that's it's definitely worth budgeting some extra in 2021. Because it's it's probably going to continue to be an expensive uh, administrative cost. So the bottom line um, is that we'll we'll have some money left over in 2020 budget to um, to do to address some things that we expect may still come up before the end of the year. Um, we have put in a request for funding uh, from the feds for our COVID expenses. Kirsten is not too optimistic about whether we're going to get any reimbursement on that. Um, we're just not in the category that they're looking for, and our expenses are not in the category that they're looking for. So um, we think we'll end up uh, having to cover some of those costs. How much were those costs? About $122,000 so far this year. So far. Is there any hope for any of the future um, uh, kind of CARES Acts or, or, or that? that I'm actually attending a meeting today at 1.30 and another one tomorrow um, about all of that and trying to gather more information. And trying everything we can, so yeah. Sure. Have we been in touch with like some of our congressional delegation representatives that we certainly can. Is there any way they can help us with that? I'd be happy to thank you. And I'm talking to the other people on the scene. Thank you, Obvious future possibilities for you know, we, we keeping did. some of those dollars, but it's not over yet. So there's still money. <laughs> we did hear that we would um, be eligible for twenty five thousand dollars through the CARES Act through the city's uh, award, oh. and so we're we're looking at that too. But if we don't get reimbursement from FEMA, then we won't have the match. So I'm not really sure how that's going to fall out just yet. So we're still in the learning mode right now. Okay. Yeah, and I'll uh, just not to. I, I've been disappointed with each round of, of aid that's came from for the fire service that's come out of all the acts so far from Congress. We we've asked for a lot, but this is uh, obviously, especially in municipal departments, it's having a, a big impact on firefighter staffing uh, because of you know the decreased revenue. And now we, we're starting to learn. We're starting to see revenue recover. Get a little bit better handle on that, but. Uh, is we the, the new grant uh, the grant period is opening up for stuff not for, for staffing but for stuff and I've asked staff to take a look at what our needs are to see if there's anything we can do uh, and qualify we've had a hard time in the last 10 years qualifying for anything in the grant world 
So, uh, but uh, anticipating maybe another uh, another aid package that uh, the fire service, but the International Association of Chiefs, International Association of Firefighters are right there in Congress trying to get the, the appropriate funding in there to, to maintain our staffing nationwide and to, to keep our capital funds. Or, or but again, in the municipal side, there's sales tax reliant. Uh, there's that's a pretty big impact across the country. So, uh, and it's had an impact on us as well. So, uh, but I appreciate that. We'll, I'll, I'll, I'll give yeah. Sally a shout and see if there's anything they can do. So, I'll get her hooked up with Kirsten. Okay, great. Uh, Darren had a, a comment too. Yeah, it's you know it's interesting to hear you talk, Tom, about this and Ann. Um, um, you know, it's, first of all, CARES Act and COVID funding has really not supported sort of existing staffing levels or overtime, those kinds of things. So we've, we've had a very difficult time trying to get reimbursed for actual expenses. Um, I don't, I don't want to say that's zero, certainly not. There's probably 30% of our CARES funding is going to go towards sort of city organizational needs, but then the other 40% to um, business and residents for um, supporting for rent and, and um, business assistance, things like that. But it's interesting, Tom and Ann, and, and um, at some point it might be worth having our grants folks look at this, but you know, the FAA has contributed very significantly to airports um, CDBG or HUD has given significant resources. Um, the Department of Justice has given a, a decent amount of resources. So through, through COVID. So it's interesting to me, and I'm not disputing anything that you're saying. I'm just intrigued as to why, why, there, why there wasn't um, at least a share that came into the fire services. So I don't, I don't know if there's if that's intentional, I don't, I just don't know, but it's, but at minimum, it's, it, it would be interesting to better understand those trends. And if that's the case nationwide or, or if it's just, you know, Colorado. Do you have any thoughts well, about they, that, they Tom? Did. Yeah, I do. Uh, naturally, they did increase the amount of uh, grant funding to go in the assistance for firefighters grant, which is the, uh, those are the capital type funds. Uh, and they did increase slightly the the, the safer grant, the, the ask, and I can't don't quote me because I man, I only try to guess, but I can't remember what the ask was. But it was uh, it was like a billion ask and got a hundred million, so uh, something those kinds of those kinds of numbers. Uh, and there was pretty good data supporting the, the number of, of jobs that are potentially lost. So um, it's just, and I understand too. Congress is. Yeah, you know, they've got, you know, they're taking a trillion dollar slice of pie and trying to divvy that up and make sure that communities have those CDBG things and those, all those other components and where, where do they cut the pie. So the fire service has received money, but it, it's not, uh, it, it's not to the point that we believe nationally it's going to be sufficient to sustain levels of service uh, across the board, across the country. We're very fortunate here that our level of service is uh, is, uh, we've maintained that. In fact, we are, we're talking about increasing that over the next two or three years we're going to talk about it in the budget. So uh, that's, uh, that, that's the good news. Uh, it, it would be, uh, it would be it, uh, beneficial if we had that opportunity to use some of that staffing funding uh, to be able to more wide or more, more robustly funded, I should say. So, uh, so it's not that they totally neglected the fire service, but uh, our ask was a little higher. Of course, that's probably everybody's case. Our, our ask was higher than what we received. Thanks, Tom. So we'll keep uh, Kirsten, Kirsten continues to watch all of the all of the opportunities as they come along and, and apply. Um, the other thing that we have that. Uh, potentially could be an issue before the end of the year is uh, reimbursements for some of our deployments. You know, we have firefighters up on the Cameron Peak Fire. Um, we've had them on other places and um, we had the USAR deployment down to the hurricane. Um, those funds probably will not arrive back to us in 2020. Um, 
and so we want to plan it plan accordingly for that and and we will be reimbursed um, on the USAR on the USAR reimbursement. We're re reimbursed directly at our cost, so uh, and we don't have any equipment or anything. So uh, there, that's just a, an even Stephen uh, sent our people out on the wildfire side. Uh, we also not only do they pay for our, we've got it built in to pay for our folks to deploy, but also pays for our backfill, whether we have to backfill that position or not. Uh, so if we have staffing that we don't have to backfill, uh, there, there's a little bit of black uh, uh, received from that. And we also uh, rent our equipment that we take, we get a, a, a rental fee from that. So traditionally, we've come out pretty good on our deployments. And our deployments of, uh, all of our deployments uh, this year have been in Colorado. Uh, so, but it takes a while for the bureaucratic machinery to, to turn all those cogs to turn to get that reimbursement and clearly that'll be in 21 at this point uh, does that come from from, from, from FEMA or? yeah FEMA money USAR is FEMA money uh, they have a USAR budget so that comes to, from uh, the FEMA money uh, and then uh, the it's on the wildfire it's more likely uh, USDA money but it can be FEMA money as well uh, out of their firefighting funds that they have for the year and it, uh, the fires we've been on have all been federal shows uh, that would well i guess we had a, a state show on the Lewiston fire uh up in risk canyon uh that was uh, the state but we still gotta get the it's the same reimbursement agreement from that so uh, we're we're in good shape for that it just takes a while for it to come back how many people do we have deployed on camera feet? You know, I've, uh, Vandy is out there. Uh, I know we brought four home yesterday. I think we were redeploying four back up. Um, okay. uh, Chief, did we, did we okay. send more people back up? Uh, we just did a mutual aid yesterday for the Sheriff's Department, but we haven't gotten a, or received a request for the fire yet. We're anticipating a, a need for um, to be deployed up there, but we haven't received anything as yet. Uh, with that, with that threatening Red Feather Lakes area, which is crazy to think that, okay, it's it is threatened us to spark and Red Feather Lakes in the same fire. It gives you some idea of how big a fire that is. Yeah. Um, but uh, like I know, I know from watching social media, we we brought more home. They've been up there for two weeks, uh, and so we anticipate that and we have what uh, Chief Vanderbilt is talking about with the mutual aid side of that is uh, like during high park we have what we call the 911 call if things blow up we're just going to send people you know we're going to call the local jurisdictions which is outside of the normal ordering process that's some of that what's going on and that was mutual aid that comes to the sheriff's department and they make sure we get a reimbursement for that just so they have the support uh if something blows up uh, hopefully they're getting that narrowed down they're able to do some direct attack on it and get a slow down on that red feather side of it. But back to budget. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's just amazing the, the activity that goes on in these operations you, out there at the training center yesterday with all the helicopters and all the yeah. efforts that our people are making. You know, it's just amazing that uh, what what the staffs do on those. Yeah, for, for our city members, the district board met at training yesterday and we did a little tour of the burn building and just a uh, on the other side of our, our training center, 10 helicopters coming in and out uh, on the fire. So that hella base operations uh, are, are ran there. And also, they've been running the DC 10. Uh, they, they call it the VLAT, the very large air tanker. Uh, they got it, uh, a few trips on that. And I can't remember how much it is for each time it drops, but it's a lot of money. Uh, yeah, it's because it drops a lot of story. But finally, this is in, and there's been some. Some questions and criticisms about the, that they weren't fighting this fire aggressively enough, and it just was not in terrain and a fuel type where those aircraft could fly. And it was hot, windy, and now it's now finally the fire has gone into a place where uh, the, the the incident management team is comfortable with what they call direct attack, meaning they're right up against the fire trying to build fire line and, and stop it. Uh, putting it out, that's going to be Mother Nature that's going to finally put it out. 
that they're they're getting a, they're getting some direct attack on it. So that's kind of an update there. Right. Here we go. Um, so that's all been about 2020, and we don't normally talk about the current year budget when we talk about budget, but this is an unusual year, as as everybody has said, the word unprecedented gets used an awful lot this year. Um, so 2021, um, we first, of course, look at our revenue. Um, flat is a ha is happy news. Um, the uh, city's revenue allocation formula is is basically flat. Sales and use tax is um, significantly lower by about nine hundred thousand dollars than it was for the 2020 budget. But thankfully, um, that's offset by the property tax uh, reassessment that was done in 2019. Um, and it comes out basic, basically equal, um, down just a, a hundred thousand dollars or so, which is on uh, a forty million dollar budget. Uh, we can live with that. Um, the district is down um, a bit too. Again, this may be uh, adjusted before the end of the year. We do not yet have our um, certi certification of assessed valuations for 2021. Um, that normally comes out in August. Now they've revised that to October, um, partly because of the, I guess, because of COVID and um, they got a special dispensation from the governor or something. And so um, we've, we've budgeted that at flat. It may go up a little bit for growth um, in between 2020 and 2021. Uh, and we'll update that before we have final. Um, so fundamentally, we're, we're down about $350,000 in 2021. Um, some of that from the city, some of it from the district. We're hoping that's going to improve before the end of the year. Um, we do continue to pay uh, uh, for two dispatch positions out of this uh, allocation from the city. Um, in 2021, we're also being asked to contribute for a homelessness coordinator, um, which is built into our um, uh, uh, non discretionary. Uh, adjustments. Uh, that's just $20,000, but that's a contribution back to the city. Um, and those are all built into our, uh, our projections for 2021. Could, could I speak to that position? For, yeah, absolutely. For briefly, uh, something that we were working on before COVID is, is us participating in that. So is the police department, so neighborhood services, it's a pretty broad effort. And our anticipation of that is by working closely with that that community or that part of the community, they have a huge impact. We have some of the some of our clients or patients, we are seeing up to four or five times a day. So we are looking for inroads, any place we can participate to relieve some of that pressure on our system. That that puts pressure on a RAM, it puts pressure on engine one, engine five. Those are the those are the areas that are using or that are seeing the homeless population the most. And our anticipation is. Uh, working to to find the resources for those people in our community other than 911, the most expensive healthcare system in the country is 911. So uh, we believe that for a $20,000 a year investment, uh, that it, it's, it's worth the shot to try to help curb those calls uh, and keep our capacity open for the more critical calls. That's why uh, we would like to contribute to that position with uh, the city. Yeah, I mean, we've seen time and time again the preventative things that we've done, you know, being whether it's, you know, RAM or it's, you know, the, the social uh, workers going into uh, the mobile home parks. And we've seen those preventative programs really kind of help right. pull some of those calls away. So, I mean, it's, it's probably a small cost and hopefully we'll, you'll see uh, some of those numbers trending downwards with the with folks that are, you know, four and five calls. I mean, that's... Uh, kind of Chief, good. sorry, Chief, Chief, can I, I, I see an opportunity here. Can I jump in on that, please? Um, again, this is not, this is not uh, by chance. It is a purposeful strategy. And in the, sta the community risk assessment standard of cover that you all adopted in March, we have three objectives that we really are working on studying uh, to work on our system. And the number one objective is to intervene in the growing incident volume. And this directly impacts that. We always want to try to re reduce 
call volume, prevent harm first, fix the problem up front, and then review and assess our deployment models um, and always try to be more efficient in that. And I think we've done that this year with uh, looking at our the Bureau One and Safety One programs, which have been very successful, but how can we do it differently? How can we do it better? What's uh, cost effective versus use? Changing in our CAD dispatch profiles, ERF to calls, all the things that we've been working on. And then number three, the use of static and dynamic deployment models and how do we best do that? Um, and they complement each other. It's not in competition. And so this is purposeful strategy uh, that has been implemented to meet the need um, of our community to do it as cost effective as possible. Um, and then at the, the time that we come and ask for personnel to meet the needs, the objectives that are adopted by the board, which is our response time benchmarks, uh, you know we've done our work up front. Thank you. Spoken like a very, very good accreditation manager in planning. <laughs> I, appreciate, Ron. I appreciate that, Chief Tim, uh, very much. Well, I'm sure it's a stress reliever, too. I mean, I can't imagine going to that, I mean, as a firefighter, going to that same person, you know, day after day and, and serving them and, and not maybe even feeling like this person will have those kind of resources, the tools to do that, the expertise to do that versus you know, I mean, that's not, that's not, you know, your ex area of expertise isn't working with people with necessarily with mental health issues and, and, and substance abuse and, and homelessness and all the things that go along with that. So, and, you know, we're, we're trying, I think, as a city, too, is to try to make sure that the right people are responding to the right situations, whether it's the police or the firefighters. And so I think... I, I imagine this is my will be money well spent. Darren had a comment as well. Go ahead, Darren. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, Ron, Ron pretty much covered, between Ron and Kristen, covered what I was going to say. You know, I'm thinking about just our fiduciary responsibility as PFA board members. Most of us have, you know, other organizations we're looking out for. We call our day jobs. But, you know, as we're, we sit on the PFA board, one of the things I think that would be good is to understand how this $20,000 investment, um, what's the return on that? And, and I'm very supportive of it as, as sitting Andrew and Tom, I appreciate your, you know, advocacy and contribution towards this. Um, the police chief as well, we're taking funding from police services to help fund this homeless services coordinator position and also adding money to Outreach for Collins to help um, have more resources on, on that end. But you know, I think, I think Ron addressed kind of in concept what I was hoping to hear, and that is that how will we measure um, the effectiveness, the value of this $20,000 investment? And um, call volume is one. But I, 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 I think that we're onto something between PFA and outreach and um, sustainability services and police services and the downtown um, various organizations, CBA or DDA, I'm sorry. It, it, it'd be good to just kind of keep an eye on and, and maybe, maybe you know, um, coming into next spring, um, report, have, have the homeless services coordinator come in and report to the PFA board so we have some visibility, greater visibility into this and then also watch the metrics so that that's what I had to share. But I'm I I really um, I really appreciate this kind of this kind of partnership. And for David, Dave, and um, Mike, you know we're not we're not just saying hey fund a new position. What we're doing is actually trying to take from various different parts of this big budget and um, and with without having a detrimental impact on those budgets. But but adding this this uh, this. Um, and not even a pro new program, it's investing in, in work that we've already been doing. Uh, uh, De Chief, can I, can I weigh in on that again? Thank you, Darren, that was awesome. But can I, I, I have an idea? Please. So uh, Assistant Chief John Fine, who's over patrol, works very closely with uh, our Operations Chief, uh, Rick Vandervelde and uh, EMS Battalion Chief, Kevin Waters. And, and we have been doing this work with dispatch as well as with uh, uh, PD on, you know, how do we impact each other's work? Because uh, 
we call for them, they call for us. And, and this is part of that whole intervene to that growing incident volume. Who responds to these issues and how do we, how do, we do it? And I think this is an excellent opportunity with this position, uh, Darren and, and, and Chief Dement, is to, uh, is to actually create a, a working group uh, with planning and analysis, CMS, uh, Chief Vandervelde, patrol, uh, the homeless coordinator, uh, and even some of the data folks uh, that we have out of planning, our GIS coordinator, data analyst, and maybe comparable on the, on the PD side. So we can sit down and we can actually collaborate on what, what, what are each of us working on, looking at, what are, we, what are we moving towards? And then we can actually push strategic objectives uh, to the, the chief officers and through the board and the city council so that we can, it, it's all coordinated instead of multiple people working in different areas. So I, uh, Darren, I think that's a, a wonderful opportunity, really. Should uh, the ambulance Thanks, service Ron. also, what that, should the ambulance service also be involved in this? I, I don't know that I would, I would defer to Darren to see if the ambulance service is involved in helping fund that. The ambulance service is involved with the police department, with the community paramedic and the, uh, the, the co-responder program that goes out with uh, the police department on a lot of these calls. And I'm not, I'm not familiar with that, them being involved in the funding. I'm not sure that they are. Yeah, I would agree, Tom. I, I, I'm, I don't think UC Health is. They are, they are helping fund other various programs related to this, this topic. Um, I'll, I'll confirm, but I'm, I'm about 95% sure that there's no UC Health funding on this one. I think Chief I'll, Waters I'll, would be. Yeah, I think Chief, Chief Waters would be an awesome one to weigh in on that, on, on the who and the what, on the UC Health side, being that we are the uh, authority having jurisdiction for EMS. <laughs> Well, I was thinking more, rather than funding, I was thinking more of the team you were talking about, Ron. UC Health might be a part of that. Yeah, and that's why uh, Chief Waters is very, uh, I can't speak to it, I'm sure he's on the call here today, but very intimately familiar with uh, UC Health's programs, uh, how we're collaborating on the EMS side as well as with police. And he, he's uh, working in those meetings with patrol and uh, Chief Vandervelde, uh, right now, and, and and they're they're doing all kinds of things, looking at the Im impacts of state laws. And, uh, so I, I I just I think by the nature of the role, the authority that we have as as uh, the AHJ, that Chief Waters would would be would just what he would weigh in on that and, and work with UC Health. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. I'm here. And I don't know specifically if uh, UCH is contributing to funding for this position, but uh, UCH is working collaboratively with us in this space on a variety of other initiatives. Um, but I'm not, I'm not certain if they're specifically funding this position. Well, thank you then we can definitely follow up with um, more going forward. All right. Well, that sounds got, great. I've got a couple more slides to get through too. I don't want to cut off conversation, but um, so we start with revenue. We look at our non-discretionary increases. And in 2020, 2021, that is not going to include salary adjustments. So that's usually our biggest ticket item for our non-discretionary increases. But when we went to contract negotiation with the local, um, we started with the expectation that there wouldn't be any economic issues. Um, we had certainly a lot more uncertainty at that point. We were concerned about whether we were going to have to cut positions before the end of the year. That didn't come to fruition. Um, but there clearly is not money um, in the budget for raises. Um, and that's not unusual. I don't believe the city of McCollins is giving uh, most of its employees raises. Um, and uh, other municipal departments are not giving uh, firefighter raises, but um, we're gonna have to keep an eye on that going forward because uh, we don't wanna get too far out of our future. Um, so we wanna make sure we're monitoring that um, in 2022 and going forward. And uh, we have some other non-discretionary increases, um, software licensing costs um, that continue to, to grow. Um, we have some Personnel increases, longevity pay, pension increases, death and disability insurance, premiums gone up. Health insurance is going up. 
dental is going down. Um, we're and and uh, we're adding a um, the uh, uh, what is it called? Breast cancer, yes. breast cancer, yes. presumptive cancer to our insurance program, um, which is great um, and it's pretty inexpensive. But again, it's on this list of insurance increases and again that homelessness coordinator. Um, so we've got about three hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of increased expenses um, to uh, to deal with in twenty twenty one. But we're also you're, you're projecting adding six new positions. Yeah, I'm trying to get my slides to go forward to that next one. Uh oh, that's right. There we go. Um, and so to balance that budget, we're going to go to two sources. We've got some ongoing earmark funds that we've been saving up from 2018 to 2020 um, with the idea of hiring a future uh, company, uh, either a, uh, as we've talked about this over the years, either the third support company or station 15. Um, so right now we're focusing in more on that uh, third support company, but we'll talk about that here in a minute. And we also have some money set aside in an insurance reserve Last year, our insurance rates went down, and we said that's not going to last. Let's set that money aside and plan for that. To we're going to need that again in the future. And so here we are, a year later, saying, "Oh look, insurance rates went back up." So we want to cover that um, in uh, 2021 with those uh, those reserves. So um, our plan for those existing ongoing earmarked funds is to um, begin addressing some of the growth in the demand for service through planning for that next uh, next uh, crew, um, the third support company. Um, one of the concerns that the um, staff has is you know go out and try and hire 16 people and start a crew all at once and then expect them to be up and running like that. So we want to hire those folks over several years' time. Um, I could address them. that too. With Chairman Braun out there, he can jump in at any time. But through the changes with Tipsy and how we evaluate our response times, we're not meeting our response time benchmark on a third support company. We we purchased it. We'll probably have it here for the October meeting or someplace to see it. Uh, as you remember, we purchased a replacement heavy rescue. Uh, it is a very large truck. Uh, but our third support company would not be a ladder company. Uh, it would just be the, the support companies do what we call opening up. They, they do the forcible entry to get into buildings. They do uh, any kind of ventilation that's necessary. They do search and rescue on fires and they do technical rescue, uh, automobile extrications. And we're not meeting our, uh, we have, we're basically divided into urban and rural response areas. The urban area meaning uh, City of Fort Collins and Town of Timnath are our urban response profile areas uh, as, as Timnath grows. And to, to meet our eight minute uh, benchmark response time, uh, that is something that uh, is critical for us to deploy. We staff those support companies at four people. So what we are proposing is that we incrementally hire those people over a period of years rather than trying to hire 15 at once. This is not new money in the budget. This is money that we set aside in the budget uh, last year that's ongoing money that we're taking that from. We used it one time in 2020 uh, to put into uh, Station 7 construction. But we're proposing that we use some of that, uh, not all of it, but some of it in uh, 2021 to begin that staffing. There, there, there is an escape valve, uh, or there's a pilot valve, and there's an escape valve. Well, there's two metaphors that are kind of crazy or intended. The, the, the pilot ability is that it give, this will give us an opportunity till we have the complete staff to be able to staff that to do some experimentation with an, another uh, RAM in, our, in the, the south part of the PFA. Engine 5 has become our busiest station or our busiest engine company uh, as we've as the uh, low acuity calls have spread out uh, across the, the, the community. And so it give us some, some ability to experiment with that. Also give us the ability to have coverage positions and lessen our overtime exposure. Uh, so we would have staffing available every day, you know, not every day, but we'd have more staffing available that would uh, uh, 
limit or, or reduce our overtime exposure. And uh, then the, the escape part of that is if, if we turn into a, another pandemic or there's a, a, another economic downturn, uh, we can certainly, uh, as we <laughs> see some of the older people coming about, but we can certainly attrition those positions back down to where we are now if, if, if uh, we run into those economic times. So something we want to put in front of the board for discussion, we, we do have that. I see Chief Sims on the, on the TV, uh, but um, we, uh, we, we believe it, it's something we've been looking forward to. We, we have, uh, we, have, we have the equipment right now, it's a, it's a reserve apparatus where we put in service the reserve apparatus, but it certainly put us in, uh, into the motion of, uh, of having that ability uh, into the future. Um, we talked about this yesterday, but I, I think it's, I'd like to have that data come before the board, have, show us the data that says, yeah, we really ought to do a third or a second RAM and a third company. Uh, yeah, we're not, in, in this case, we're not saying and, we're saying this gives us a chance to pilot, yeah. do some experimentation uh, with yeah. the additional staffing in that interim phase to see, to yeah. bring back better data to say what a RAM would do. Uh, but then certainly uh, Ron and his staff uh, can come when we come back in November for the work session yeah. and give you that data on the third support company. Uh, we wanted to really get that out to you at this, at this point though, because with COVID and with restrictions of other people's budgets and stuff, there, there's an optical thing there is that you know, we're hiring new positions. But this is money that we've been setting on for several budgets. It's two or three budget cycles building that toward. We didn't know if it was going to be an additional support company or a station in Montava or a station in Timnath that's like County Road 5 and Mulberry. We know those two stations are coming, but they're probably more longer range down in the in the future. So, uh, but the support company, as the community grows, uh, it would probably uh, what what uh, Ron tells me is through our GIS studies, and I also see the Laura Robinson is on the call, but through our GIS studies, it would probably be station to station four, which would give us our coverage and, and start allowing us to meet our benchmark on response time. That, that's what driving that on the data side. So we definitely can bring that back in November. Well, uh, Chief, I, I have a couple questions. I, I, uh, we performed a staff analysis in this board packet. Um, there are maps definitively showing drive time issues in the southwest portion of our jurisdiction, you have performance maps and predictive analytic maps that show the improvement in response time compliance in the southwest portion of the jurisdiction. You have data on specific impacts to station five with potential, uh, the new computer aided dispatching system, which implies, I'm sorry, that's, uh, Finding land that is either cheap or easy to get is not always the best station location policy. So station 14 is pretty far south and we have huge holes uh, in the southeast portion of our jurisdiction, which you can see both in the standard of cover as well as uh, in the data that's presented, the map that's presented for closest unit. Closest unit does it by street speed. And so you're gonna get engine five when all things are equal, everybody's at home, you're gonna get engine five all the way out to Ziegler and Harmony uh, and all the way down into Loveland. So it's a huge stationary, big, very big impact. And again, as the chief spoke to, we know that the majority of the calls that they are going on with the, their 12, you know, station five has moved up to a 12% uh, UHU, unit hour utilization, uh, well above engine one, who with the implementation of the RAM, when we showed you the workload study, they have, uh, their workload has come down. Um, in the South, the response time compliance, and I, I'm excited to do a pilot because I, my belief is, is the response time compliance is gonna be, uh, we have not found it to be as uh, impressive as what we thought it would be, but when you look at the stationaries in the standard of cover, station one, two, and three are basically 1710 built uh, stationaries. They're small and the stations are well located within the jurisdiction, the planning zone. This is all in the standard of cover. Um, in the South, you have stations that are far away. They're large station areas. Travel time compliance is horrible. 
And we have crews running uh, around the entire system from station 10 all the way out into fours area trying to cover. Um, we know in the south and the southwest, when you look at the workload for station four, it includes station nine and 11. But we also know that station 11, there's going to be some changes there because Loveland is so close with their new station seven. So there's a lot of dynamics here. Like I can't give you, um, there's a lot of dynamics that are, that are, are going to change a little bit with the closest unit dispatching, but we know, so we know we've been saving for two years, this $900,000 every year because we need a, a third support unit. Um, anytime we send it, we have a significant call, uh, a, a structure fire, a rescue. Uh, we have to send both of our support units uh, to do that work because it's, it's all about getting staffing and some of that equipment onto the scene. And then we have a city that's empty. Um, we have been very fortunate. We're a very safe city. We don't have multiple, uh, multiple incidents going on at, at once a lot. We do have some, so we, we, we know, we know that it's significant, but my, my overall question is, is, and I, and I need, I can send a memo as well, providing page numbers in this standard of cover. I know you all received that in March and things to specifically look at in there. We have the staff analysis that we've provided for you, but I specifically would like to know when we talk about what, what data are you looking for? What do you want to see to be presented? Because I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to have to guess and, and, and what I'm trying to bring in, in uh, uh, the work session. So thank you. Ron, the reason, the reason I brought this up is that I, I think um, it's much better for you to be here and give us a presentation like you just did. But I mean, bring, bring those slides out and put them up on the front and talk with us about them so we get a better feel for them. Uh, and certainly you're right. I mean, I looked at all those maps in this packet and, and studied them, and, but it's a lot more meaningful to have you talk to us about it and show them to us as well. So that's that's where I was coming from. I think that'd be a great um, way to do the uh, the okay. group sessions. Definitely built in there. Um, yeah. Since this really is it's a fairly simple budget because there's not much money to work with, and we yeah. can really focus down in on that um, on those maps and that deployment. So that'll be a, a, a yeah. good subject for our discussion. And let me tag on to Ron's discussion. You know, we and thank you to the board. We've worked several years of bringing on new software. We've had software challenges. We've tried some, we've set it aside. We redefined a position and we brought in uh, Laura Robinson who was doing fantastic work and identifying those gaps. So we look at, when we look at issues of, you know, 10, 15, 20 years now, just for the, for the, the Fort Collins and, and the PFA community, the, the, the Fort Collins Poudre Valley Fire Protection District, the growth there. But when we also, we've had, uh, we, we've, we've touched on the issues of consolidation and, and partnering with our neighboring communities. We're sending closest units now. So how do that, how does that all fit in to meet those gaps? Because as, as the community grows and we build in better fire protection, there you go, Dave. Uh, but as communities grow, we do that. The medical demands are our critical calls still in number remains, they, they remain there. And we're still the only folks in town that says fire on the door. Fire right. is still going to happen. Right. So meeting those benchmarks is we look into the future for the next 20 years. And, and a lot of those gaps, when we look where we grew to the south and, and building those larger station areas, when we built those, traffic wasn't as big as it is now, so we had, we had some drive time issues there, but also uh, we were looking for economies of scale as best we could in, in where funding mechanism worked. Uh, so putting that, that higher density for those stations uh, is a challenge, but there's opportunities in the future, and I think having, having Ron and his staff come and put the slides up on there and, and just do show you that analysis, I'm, I would be very proud to have them do that because yeah. that's that's hard work and money that this board has spent to get us there. But I'm, but I'm shy and I don't like to talk. Uh, yeah, uh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank yeah. you, Dave. I, a, absolutely, I would, I would love to come. Um, this is, and I guess some of this is the difficulty of being in this COVID environment. Um, it's hard to present and, and uh, I'm finding that across the board from our senior leadership team and, and uh, you know, in, in, even into the organization where we've lost some communication. So absolutely, I would love to do that. Thank you.
Thank you. So let's get, make sure that we schedule that. Okay. So I want to go back, uh, if I can get the slides to work again. There we go. Um, I want to go back and talk um, sort of big picture about 2020 versus 2021. Um, we have available ongoing funds from the earmark funds that we've had um, that total about $1.1 million. We also have that insurance reserve that I talked about from, um, from the previous year's uh, savings. Um, and so to, to spend that, we've got our non-discretionary increases, um, personnel related software, we've already talked about those. Um, on the positive side, last year, or 2020 was a leap year. Um, we don't have to pay that extra day in 2021, so that's a plus. Um, and then we've got these six new positions that we're proposing. Um, three for the Spring Academy and three for the Fall Academy. The overall impact is about four and a half FTE because it's not the full year, um, but uh, about $300,000 worth of that ongoing revenue would go to, the, to those new positions. We are doing full cost budgeting on that. So when you look at your materials, you'll see numbers that say 700 and some thousand dollars. That's the ongoing long-term cost of that. We want to make sure we're setting aside all of that so that we know in future years, if we never got another additional dollar from anybody, we'd still be able to pay it with our existing level. So, uh, but in the first year, that's $300,000. Um, that leaves us with um, about $700,000 in ongoing money um, that we can reallocate to something. We're saying we, we want to reallocate that to Station six renovations, that's the addition at station six. Um, we had put some money into that in 2020. Um, it's come back a little more expensive than we expected. Uh, apparently the same thing happened at the city when they were adding the same uh, additional bay space and um, the price tape came back higher um, about the same time. So we're setting aside some money. We're still in the process of trying to figure out how to, to contain those costs. And we're pretty excited about the work that um, that uh, is being done on, on reevaluating the, the scope of that project. And uh, hopefully we won't spend all, all of the money that we have available for it. Um, it also leaves us on that one-time column side with a little bit more money for insurance reserve for the future. Um, we are concerned about, we don't have our workers comp and our property and liability insurance uh, um, bills for 2021 yet. We don't have our, our cost estimates yet. We should have those in the next few weeks. Uh, but we'll have that before final. Uh, and then those numbers will adjust and hopefully down. We're trying to uh, budget conservatively, but we think uh, workers' comp and property liability are both going to go up. Payroll seems to be catching up to us. Uh, and uh, so our rates for, for our property insurance are going up because of that. Um, we already talked about this hiring the future crew and we'll bring back um, a presentation about that in the November meeting. Um, and just finally, we want to talk about um, how we're spending some of our capital funds. Um, as Tom mentioned earlier, Station 7 is back up and running. That project had been frozen earlier in the year because of the uncertainty and uh, we, didn't we never took any money away from it. And so we uh, are now back in the planning process and um, hope to know more still in 2020 with construction perhaps in 21 or 22. Uh, burn building, that was ready to uh, close the deal uh, before the, before this all started. So um, we hope we can get back. Oh, I'm not sorry, burn building is done. We have to pay for that. Station six is uh, back at, uh, in the process and hopefully we can uh, um, close the deal on that one and get construction started in 2021, uh, early part of 2021. We do have some unknowns. We always do at this preliminary uh, budget. Uh, the, the county has not given us our certification of assessed valuations um, for the district, and really they haven't given them for the city either. So um, uh, there may be some adjustments there um, on the assessed valuations. And um, we're going we're gonna to continue to monitor that property tax payment in, uh, for 2020 and uh, see how we come out. That may be a good predictor for us about 2021 and whether people are just unable to pay and some of those properties are going to go to tilt tax lien sale. We'll, uh, we'll be watching that. 
Um, again, our workers' comp rates we don't know, our property and liability we don't know. Um, we don't know that final cost estimate for station six and um, FPPA costs. We had those conversations uh, that two years ago now when they uh, FPPA changed our rates. That's going to come to fruition in 2021 or begin to. And what the final cost on that is still something for you know, uh, and who, how many people that impacts and by how much. So we'll, we'll have that wrapped up by November. Um, so we've already talked about some of these questions. Does the board support the use of the, using those incremental, those earmarked funds for this incremental hiring process? Um, does the board support the idea of adding a RAM unit in 2021? Um, in that interim spot. And um, do you have any concerns about using our insurance reserves for ongoing insurance costs because those are one-time reserves? Because that's going to catch up to us in the long run, but hopefully in that in the extended year. So those are some of the things that that if you have any concerns or direction before the the uh, work session, we'd sure like to hear those or anything else. Okay. Well, Leo, that there, there's one more appropriation for 2020 that we need to discuss on the OEM side. Yeah, for the EOC? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, for uh, one of the, there's an opportunity for the city, uh, and Darren can, can add to this the things I missed. I was contacted by uh, Jim Byrne. If you remember, we uh, transferred the, the operations of emergency management to the city and it's working out phenomenally. Uh, Lieutenant Byrne is doing a fantastic job. Of his, his first year he's been challenged with things like COVID and uh, a fire that's impacting the city's uh, watershed significantly and a few other things. Uh, one of the things they've looked for though is that the new EOC currently they use our uh, training division, we have a room that's dedicated to that in our first training building out there, and it limits our use of that building, uh, or that room at least. And uh, uh, Darren has worked with Jim to identify some space in the city's footprint. Uh, that would be uh, something that we would propose that the board could appropriate out, appropriate out of reserve funds uh, in this current year. Uh, this is something they need to be. There's some CARES Act money that would be as, as far as and, and some uh, police money as well to uh, to fund that. So uh, we'll we'll be bringing that proposal back in October uh, that we do that. But I didn't want that to be a surprise. I don't know if Darren has any comments on it, but it gives the opportunity to put the EOC or any uh, downtown footprint, which um, puts it close to all of our operations, the city's operations, but also when we come out of our mask and start having our street festivals and all the stuff that happens downtown again that gives us coordination of the law enforcement medical and fire components of those of those calls the management or those those events uh, right in the heart of it so uh it, it very it would see a lot more use of what we're seeing out there and it would free up classroom space that we have out there and give us a, a some more flexibility in our current capital footprint uh without having to add additional square feet I can't remember what the ask was on that. We just heard about this one. The ask was 100,000. Darren has his hand up. So. Yes, uh, thanks, Tom. I, I wasn't planning on saying anything, but I, I think it's um, a solid uh, change. I mean, obviously, I'm supportive of it, and we're looking to leverage CARES funding if we can um, through this. So I think. All in all, it's a good move, and and Tom, I appreciate your comments about Jim and his leadership. I'm I'm in full agreement. I think he's done an amazing job in a in a very very complex first year. But um, and I'll I'll be sure that that I share that feedback to Tom. But yeah, I think this is a I think this is a good investment. It's a good leverage opportunity, and and um, uh, it's good work. And I'd like to ask. With respect to question one, does the board support beginning use of earmarked funds? What is your thoughts on if we if we go ahead and do that? How do we? What's the plans to replenish those funds as they take it down? Well, it's um, the reason that we've been saving them. And, well, we've been spending them each year as if they were one-time money on capital projects. 
but we've been saving them in terms of that that uh, increase in ongoing revenue for this kind of purpose. So in a sense, they're not really going to be replaced. We hope to get more um, in future years to fill out that crew that we're expecting um, to, to need in 2023, perhaps. Um, and so um, I, I think this is exactly what we've been planning on using it for um, ongoing. And we've been using it short term for one time costs. And it's been a, it's been a help to us because we could really catch up on a lot of our capital needs um, by using those one-time, those ongoing funds as if they were one-time um, capital funds. Um, I think it's it's a, a, a calculated expenditure too, because if we don't, if we have a flat budget for three years to come, or whatever it might be, um, we don't have to. We can use those positions other ways. Um, we can use them to to attrition other positions, or um, I think it's a, a flexible uh, way to spend the money uh, because we're not absolutely committed on that third support company until we have enough money to actually go all of the spots. This would just it's just a start at it. I have a question on uh, Station Six. Uh, somewhere I read, and I can't find it now, but <clears throat> somewhere I read that we there's a $900,000 overrun on that. And it makes me wonder if uh, uh, ROI that you guys anticipated in the first place makes change. I, you're looking at me like you didn't, you don't know where that is either. I, I do know what you're talking about. Somewhere um, it's in page well, 145. We had, original, got it. we had originally planned to add one bay to that station. Uh -huh. And maybe Ryan, if you want to pop in on this too, we had originally planned to to uh, put one bay on there. Um, and now we're what we really need is two bays. And so it's not really a cost overrun, it's a change okay. in scope. Change, okay. Yeah, and I don't know, Ryan, do you want to? Um, do you really want to sure, yeah, really that? This, yeah, um, and just for transparency, this this just speaks to the overload that was in the position uh, that she cannot close for trying to do the work of all the workers' comp, health and wellness, modified duty, physical therapy, as well as uh, radios, major station remodel, building station eight, and trying to do these projects. It was too much work. And so some of these things would fall through uh, the cracks, which is why having uh, Captain Hettinger in there now is proving so successful. Uh, when we started down this road, and I'm just going to tie this back in because I think you asked this question earlier, we looked at three specific options. One was a remodel of the existing facility to add two bays to not just meet the demands, one bay, which is what we need just to update and maintain our own fleet, but a, an additional bay on top of that to do regionalized fleet services. Uh, we're anticipating about fifty to seventy-five thousand uh, dollars net benefit coming back to the authority on top of the cost of that mechanic FTE, just based off of what we've already been billing and with the MOU with Windsor. We did also look out at the training center for that new building, as you noted, and we looked at is it more cost appropriate just to build a new building out of the training center because it could be a Butler building that would give us the size that we need to meet our fleet today. And so that was part of that long range uh, financial planning. And what we found is that it was cost prohibitive based off of what it would take to move the, the utilities and the infrastructure out to where that was. It actually came out to be more expensive. And so then the third option we looked at was the renovation of additional uh, pre-existing buildings that, that are within the district. There is a, a uh, an abandoned John Deere service center off of uh, uh, East Mulberry. Um, the UCH was also looking at, and so we looked at that in partnership with them so that we could take over four of the bays and they could take over two of the bays for their fleet services. Um, but it turns out that it's about six inches below the, the adjusted floodplain line uh, for the county, and so they would not allow us to do um, any remodeling. And so it did put us back to the original plan, which was the addition of two bays onto station six. When we were putting together the budget proposal for that, I asked Chief Knuckles to get uh, bids on that so that we could have an estimate of what it would cost uh, for that project. 
he came back and said that it was uh, $2 million. And so that is what we brought forward. Um, and just honestly and transparently, I didn't find out until we got right at the edge when we were getting ready to pull the trigger that what he had asked for was a bid for one bay, not for two bay. Um, and that, that was not, it hadn't been the plan. So it was misbid on the front side. Okay. So we, uh, we, I heard you say earlier then that we, we still have good justification for that second bay. I mean, we're, we, we're going to make that pay. We're, we're not going to go into a deficit because of that. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. That's correct. Um, so just, just based off the demands of our existing fleet, because the existing shop was built about 30 years ago, our fleet was much smaller. The size of the vehicles was smaller. We only had one mechanic working out there. And just to the demands of our system, we've outgrown the existing facility. And we need an additional bay just to maintain or to catch up with, uh, with our current fleet. We're often storing vehicles outside. Some of our vehicles don't fit inside the shop anymore and they have to be repaired outside in the weather. And so uh, we need an additional bay just to meet the, the demands of our existing system. Um, as we were looking at that regionalized service, uh, different revenue streams, those economies of scale, because uh, none of the fire agencies in Northern Colorado have full-time fleet services like we do. There's a strong demand for that service. Um, we thought if we're gonna go through all of the difficulties of a major construction project anyway to add a bay, which we will shortly outgrow, uh, we might as well do two bays. And then that gives us the ability to put our toe in the water towards that regionalized fleet services. Um, before we had any formalized MOUs and we were just helping out Windsor with a few small projects, we were bringing in somewhere around twenty-five dollars to $30,000 in the first quarter. Um, since we have formalized the MOU now with a defined fee structure, and uh, we are starting to get requests also from Win uh, Wellington, and as Chief DeMint said, from all of the smaller agencies, uh, Platte Valley, Front Range Fire, Evans, and then some of the Southern Wyoming uh, agencies, based off of the projections that we got from Brad Smith, our fleet services manager, he believes that we'll be able to uh, make an additional 50 to $75,000 in revenue on top of the cost of the mechanic FT. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Anything else uh, from the board? Well, I just wanna say this. Can I, I'll say it just this way. Dan, Brian, Ron, Bandy, Kirsten, how about our staff? I mean, they, it, it's, I don't get the chance to say it, and I haven't said that enough through my years, and I get fewer and fewer times to say that. But how about our staff? I mean, they work their, their, their keisters off to, to bring the U.S. budget and to you not know, bother putting the data, the reasons why. Uh, and I'm very, very appreciative of them. I just want to add that. Yeah, I would do that. Um, uh, great, 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 great answers, great explanations, and 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 being the custodian of the funds that we have. So thank you all. So yeah, I agree. I always feel like I have plenty of data to make a good decision. So I appreciate that. And we plan to bring back more information in November. Yep. And that and informed. With the that um, informed. you know, with the questions that were at the end of the slides, just you know, I mean, I think that. Um, I th thank you for Ron to, to remind us that some of that, you know, where some of those materials were and that justification of why we need that. And I, that was a really good summary for me and to understand, you know, the need. And, and I, mean, I, I think what we can't do is kind of get behind in a situation like this. And I like the idea of using, um, setting up the, the pilot of the RAM program in the south part, where, you know, part of town where we're having some struggles. Uh, in, you know, with Station 5 being able to kick off the tunnel and we've all experienced traffic delays and all the kind of delays that can happen there at the southern part of the, the, the city. So that's uh, that's appreciated. And then, you know, for, for the chief to talk about an escape, you know, what's the escape plan if, if in a few years this becomes not manageable and it's, you know, it's to, for attrition to kind of deal with some, you know, to, to take the, burden off of some of that cost. So, uh, you know, to me, it seems really good, but I'll, I'll, you know, be happy to for Ron to bring back those, you know, slides and see those next time. But um, as of right now, I feel pretty comfortable with that decision. I think 
think you know one of the messages Ron wants everybody to get out of what he's saying is um, that's why we keep trying things sure. and uh, and adapting and there isn't one right answer that we know oh if only we did this um, and that's why we keep ex not experimenting piloting things right and uh, so uh, I, I look forward to some more discussion with Ron about that. If there's no other discussion on the 2021 preliminary budget, let's move to the next item, briefing papers. Well, another business, uh, and you can tell Ron is in the mode. Uh, a week from uh, this coming Sunday and Monday, uh, our accreditation site visit team will be uh, on site. They were supposed to have been here in June. Uh, but with COVID, that's changed that. They're going to be here for an abbreviated site visit, so there won't be the dinners and stuff that we did uh, in the past. So Ron has been coordinating that. We've been meeting uh, in a Zoom environment, which has uh, been very beneficial. I think they have a very good, uh, a very good idea of what the Poudre Fire Authority is. I'm going to let Ron touch on that for just a minute, but they are they're recognizing some best practices that they want to pass on to uh, CFAI. So, uh, Ron, can you, can you touch on that on the visit? Give us some of the details of, of that and, and some of the things that you've been received so far. Uh, yes, sir. Um, we uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, we we uh, we've been doing this. This is probably the longest accreditation process ever, <laughs> and there's really good <laughs> things about it and not so good things about it, but. Uh, you know, it's not as intense as I think the first process that we went through where, and, I, and being a peer assessor, if somebody goes out and evaluates other departments, you know, you really have a lot of quick work to do. It's really fast and, and maybe not um, as comprehensible as it can be. Uh, this one's been longer. We've done some good Zooms. Uh, we have, uh, we're going to get some great recommendations in some areas that we know that we've, that actually we've already started implementing and, and, uh, some of them are going to come in that health and safety environment. Chief DeBar has done a great job of sharing what, what we've been doing, but uh, um, we're going to get some great recommendations for this whole thing. Um, the, the peer team has been very busy as well. We've had a, a couple other folks that, um, you know, they're, they're evaluating us, and, and, uh, but they've been super busy too with hurricanes back east and COVID and all the stuff that they've been doing. So it's been a unique experience. Uh, the cool part is, is that the Zoom environment, this environment, has allowed us to conduct interviews ahead of time. It's going to be a, a shorter site visit uh, by a day. Um, we're, we're developing a video, an introduction video for uh, the peer team. And I think it's actually in working with uh, Annie Bierbauer and, and Haley Spurrier, and we're going to bring in Laura to this too. I think it's actually going to be a wonderful video for our community and for the boards and um, because it's really going to, it's, it's going to be a, a, just a great snapshot of what PFA is, what we do. Excited about that. Um, you know, and then they'll come in. I, we were already trying to schedule some meetings with, uh, the board chair and, uh, um, they'll meet, meet with, uh, several other people, finish their interviews and write up their, their synopsis. And we think in March, maybe we'll, we'll be, uh, hopefully, uh, be in front of the commission and uh, working on our final accreditation. So it's moving forward. Um, Going to get more intense here over the next couple of weeks, but uh, it's, been a, it's been a great process. And, and like the chief said, um, they've been very impressed with many, many, many of our programs. Um, and they've actually, to the point where they've said, we're probably not going to be able to give all the best practices that we see to the commission um, and along with that, you know, the pride of that, there is the humility of we have areas that we do need to work on and there, those are going to be pointed out as well. So uh, great process. And, and, it, and the other thing I, I highlight is that you hear Ron's language and the language is back. We're learning about standard to cover and it's a continuous learning and continuous improvement process. And it is having an impact where we can come back and say, this is their support company, not because it feels good and, and we need it. And we bought a truck that we've got to put some people in it. it. It's it's about, you know, this is what the community needs and this is what's driving it and, and being able to look into the future and project the future what I need for. So uh, that's, that was, I think that was all of our dreams when we 
we entered into this accreditation process is that how can we help it to drive continuous improvement? And it's the thank and, and chief and chief, they don't tell us, they don't tell us what to do. They look to the board to and to the staff, this, you know, just like our process. Uh, staff makes recommendations to you and then the board adopts. And when uh, our team lead has asked us, you know, we, we've had some several difficult questions and then they say, well, that's, you know, on certain things. And I can't uh, off the top of my head, I, I can't drop it right now, but, but uh, they, you know, they say, as long as your board of directors, your community, your government, you know, if you're checking in, if they're, if they are good with what you guys are doing, that's what they want to see. They don't come in and mandate that we do, uh, anything in our organization other than than really that we have a good sound process to meet the the bare the core competencies or the things that we should be doing as a credible fire department so um, I like that too because uh, outside entities aren't or an outside entity isn't coming in to our community and saying uh, you need to do this um, our board of our board of directors does that awesome Anything else, Tom, from the region papers? Um, I think we're there. Uh, the business, I guess we, you know, we did a little update on the fire. Uh, and uh, so I think we're caught up on that, uh, caught up on the COVID and stuff. So I think we're, we're ready to, to bring stuff back to you. We've got one thing to bring back to you for that appropriation in October for EOC and then ready to bring back those answers for a work session in November. Yeah. Did you want to go over the memorial? Or oh, yes, thank you. Uh, the memorial, uh, a letter went out with Darren and I's signature. Uh, thank you, Dave. On the 9-11 memorial, uh, Emily Land, who has had great success in, in raising funds for, <coughs> for, for Eastside Park, has come on board uh, uh, working with uh, Nina Bodenhammer on, on getting, uh, getting the, the, the funding together to make this a reality. A uh, big push that went out on 9-11 uh, in the media, and Emily is, is taking the lead on that to, to raise the $600,000 that we need to uh, complete that project. The district board got to see this the steel yesterday as it's setting in our training center, uh, but we, we're really, really uh, anticipating getting this thing kicked off, and that's something that in my retirement I will stay involved with uh, to get that, to see that through completion. Just a reminder, Bob Wilson uh, is on board along with uh, uh, Beacon Construction who has made the commitment to do some in-kind work once we get the plans drawn and, and the plans are in, in that process now. So Nina and Emily are doing uh, great work. Uh, we have great, uh, great participation from a couple of, a, a couple of uh, local folks that are making uh, this progress so far and one being Bob Wilson and Combine Care, and the other one being Budweiser uh, and Gene Bocas, who's the plant manager at the local brewery. So we hope to expand that and make this a reality and, and be able to break ground on the 20th anniversary. It's not gone near as fast as we've anticipated and hoped, but we are we are just like that chicken hawk after that. We're not going to give up. We're going to make this thing happen so that we have a long-standing memorial to September 11, 2001, the, the day that you know, we're hiring, we, we will begin hiring firefighters in the next couple of years that weren't even alive when that happened. So uh, it, it's something that they will, they will have that will give them cause to remember and, and a place where we can reflect those of us who were, you know exactly where we were at the moment, a place for us to reflect. So we are very, uh, very enthused by uh, this. I think it'll be a great piece for our community. Well, very good. So, even though specific ownership taxes is low, go buy some vehicles. We're going yeah. to keep. We're going to keep on trucking. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah. So, can I um, make a comment about the the executive search too, since that is kind of stuck on the end? Absolutely. And, okay. Please do that. Um, I think that we're going to probably need to schedule a special meeting in October um, to do those interviews. And I assume that we'll try and get everybody. Uh, but what we talked about the last time was if we couldn't get everybody, we were going to go ahead anyway. 
Yeah. And I assume that that's still true. Yeah. But we'll do our best to, to make sure we can get everybody um, meeting those uh, meeting those search terms. Do you all have a preference about whether we do that in person or on Zoom? Uh, the reason I ask is because it would be much quicker to schedule uh, to do Zoom because um, we don't have to fit into their travel schedules and whatnot and get them out here or a short list out here. But um, but I I I. I'd take your, your feedback on that. Well, it makes sense to me to get people out here, especially if they're just, I, I think I personally think so. it would be better, but. This is to interview the search firm. So I'll interview the search firm. I would, I'm okay doing it in yeah. person, but I think I, I'd also be okay doing it in Zoom. And I think that would be a lot more efficient. Yeah, it seems like it would be. And, uh, I I don't feel that way about the chief. I think we really ought to have some in-person interviews there. Yeah. But uh, for this thing, I, I would I would be comfortable with Zoom. You mean when you get down to your finalist? Well, when when we get down, I'm ta yeah. she's talking about the search firm, right? Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the search firm, candidates would, will be a different thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah candidates. Are probably different. I'm good either way. Okay. All Whatever. right, Darren. 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 Yeah, um, I agree. I think search firm as soon as possible, remote interviews, perfectly fine. In fact, probably preferable. Okay. Where's Ken? Did he, did he still on camera. Is it doesn't look like he's trying to get in. So I'm, I'm here. Is. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, still, still alive here. Hey, no, that, uh, that, that sounds good to me. I would concur. Are you okay? Oh, yeah, I saw that was okay. As well. oh, okay. I think, did you, maybe people misunderstood me. Yeah, I think Zoom is better for this. I mean, it's, 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 it is different when it comes to candidates, but this is, I mean, to fly people out to maybe not get them to pump them. Yeah. I mean, it seems not. I, I think we can, you know, vet them carefully through Zoom. I think it'll be good. All right. So what we'll do, what we'll plan on doing is when we get the the um, application, <coughs> excuse me, the proposals, we'll first see how many we have, sure. and then get in touch with the, the board and see um, how we want to proceed from there. If if there's three or or thereabouts, we may just go ahead and schedule them all. If there's ten, then we'll have to talk about how you'd like to to uh, narrow, narrow that down. <laughs> If you'd like staff to help you do that, or if you'd like to have a, a subset of the full board, or uh, but we'll we'll see how that comes in. Okay. And we'll know a little bit um, as this just posted last Friday, um, so we'll know in the next week or so um, how much interest we're going to get, and, and that'll help us to 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 plan our next step. And a minor point on that, I, I was reading that contract with a search firm. Uh -huh. It's uh, signed by Tom, and I don't think that's appropriate. I mean, we should, we'll talk not that he's not a good guy, but I, I mean, <laughs> really, the board's hiring the chief. I think we probably so, just did, that was the standard contract from uh, purchasing, but yeah. we'll, uh, my, Jan my Janet, we can, uh, yeah, Jan Janet, we can work with Jerry to, <laughs> to modify that. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Didn't, didn't even look to the end like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right, good, thank you. Anything else to come before the board? Um, do you have anything for uh, for some issues on executive session? I don't think we need an executive session uh, today, but very good. You may next month. You never know. Keep it on there. Very good with that. So we'll just adjourn the meeting then. Thank you all for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you. Yeah. yeah.